and work through reciprocity. For example, by freeing all transfers of technology that enable us to save lives and restore Mother Earth. In order to revive global solidarity, we need to recognize each other and our relations within the context of all of us being humans. For example, in the context of climate change, let us recall that each state needs to earmark resources for the damage fund, damage and loss fund in proportion to the historic responsibility that should be shouldered with regard to producing greenhouse gases. Action for the Agenda 2030 will only be possible if we make peace and solidarity the driver of prosperity. We must be bold and transform war expenditures and those on death into investments for life. And with these resources, we can overcome and meet the goals of sustainable development. This is the only way to make Mother Earth sustainable within a space that functions in a safe way for all humanity. It's the only sustainable, fair, environmental, and socially appropriate way to convert the system into one that is progressive. We must achieve these goals in a fair and equitable manner for all without any political or financial impositions. Third, it's necessary and urgent to change the capitalist system in a time of neoliberalism, which multiplies and reproduces forms of domination, exploitation, and exclusion for the great majority. Brothers and sisters, the multidimensional crisis of capitalism has been laid bare in the context of post-pandemic world and has exas been exacerbated by the effects of the military conflict in Eastern Europe. And these are nothing but manifestations of the transition towards a configuration of a world order which is different from the one we currently have. In response to this, and has never happened before, the global south is raising up in a peaceful and constructive manner. They are standing for regional and interregional processes of cooperation and integration. And the clamor has increased to reconfigure the international financial system and transform our understanding of what scientific development should be that is respectful in turn of Mother Earth and how to pursue this in an equitable manner while also recognizing the historical responsibilities that need to be shouldered vis-a-vis -vis our nations and in all dimensions. Given the irreversible march towards a multipolar world, it is undeniable that each strength influences new initiatives and economic integration, trade, and cooperation amongst countries. The surgence and emergence of trade blocks such as Asia, Africa, South America, or the BRICS make it possible today for nations to have access to international markets without needing to compromise their sovereignty. And in that context, despite the adverse international context, Bolivia has implemented the Economic and Social Development Plan 2021-2025, which is entitled Rebuilding Our Economy to Live Well Towards Industrialization and Replacement of Imports. And this plan lays the foundation in order to grapple with the global economic crisis and to develop public policy to strengthen our national economy and promote our development capacity. And in this regard, action developed for the purposes of economic rebuilding and building our economic system to be more productive exceeded 6% in 2021 and management 2022 achieved 3.5% and in 2022 our nominal GDP increased by 40,703 $40, billion dollars in 2021 and reached 44 billion in 2022 which is the highest figure in our history. Likewise the GDP per capita increased by 7.4% over the figure for 2021 achieving a figure of 3.6 billion dollars again the highest figure in the history of our country. I should also mention here that what is happening this year, we see accumulated inflation, which is only of 1.6%, which is the lowest figure for our region and much lower than many countries on the planet. This indicator was achieved by us without raising interest rates, without practicing neoliberal monetary policy, and especially without reaching into the pockets of the poorest of our people, which is where inflation lives. The achievements of our country are based mainly on a horizon, which is a civilizing horizon based on living well and reivindicating the culture and life of a community, respecting living together in harmony, in balance and in complementarity with all other human beings while also being in harmony with Mother Earth and nature. Four, the climate crisis requires concrete action and renewed commitments. Bolivia has suggested through recognition of the Mother Earth in the General Assembly and through the resolution approved in April of 2009, an effort for the entire international community to become aware of the importance of restoring our natural processes for the very survival of the human being on this planet and providing for an alternative vision to, which is anti-colonial, an alternative to capitalism and mercantilism. In this understanding, our vision is based on sustainability of development and is deeply rooted in our vision of living well and in harmony with nature. This vision is born of the millennial and ancestral thoughts of our peoples and the indigenous peoples in our nations, which are the very foundation of our plurinationality. With regard to increasing needs and mitigation of adaptation to the climate crisis and the losses and growing damage, it's important that all countries assume their responsibilities. And in this context, the developed nations must assume their share of responsibility due to the climate debt and compensation for historical reparation to developing countries. The first step is to fulfill their promises and meet the pledges with regard to financial provision, transfer technology, and capacity building. In this problematic world, one common denominator is the issue of fragmenting countries for the most poor. And the scarcity of water is only increasing with the evaporation of fresh water. We urge this assembly to provide action and address this problem, a problem which is affecting the poorest of the five continents and which is beginning to affect all sectors of society. Bolivia would highlight here that this year, by consensus, the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, the BBNJ, was adopted by consensus because it is a significant step towards protecting our oceans and the sustainability and use of our resources, benefiting the developed nations especially, especially those that are landlocked. This treaty will establish rules and regulations to prevent the sustainable exploitation of resources will protect the interests of landlocked countries and will prevent the exhaustion of marine resources. The BBNJ Treaty is a historic opportunity to mark the difference in protecting our oceans because they are a common good of all humanity. And in this context, we highlight the special mention for the indigenous peoples and landlocked countries. Together, we can ensure that the oceans will continue to be sources of life and prosperity for present generation and future generations in an equitable manner. Five, 
we must continue promoting a broader view of human rights and democracy. Despite the progress achieved, the world continues to be an unequal world. And while it's true that peoples shape their own destiny, it is also true that for our peoples to live well, this has been undermined for centuries due to legal, economic, and ideological colonialism. You know better than anyone that it has not been possible to exercise the right to development due to history. The systematic transfer of wealth from the South to the North has put us at a disadvantage up until today. We have had to navigate the waters of a crisis imposed only on the South which is not the same then to talk about economic, social, and cultural rights as to talk about health, education, food, access to knowledge, and technology in a continent where, in another, in the South, and in the North, it's not the same. In this context, it's not possible to plan without also addressing the historical responsibilities. Without assuming those responsibilities, we cannot fulfill our potential as peoples and make possible our right to development. In the plurinational state of Bolivia, we have understood that democracy is not possible without development. And development cannot have better indicators than the exercise of collective rights, rights that are promoted, protected, and guaranteed by the state, but rights also that go hand in hand with a high level of democratic participation of social collectives. In Bolivia, we have understood that economic stability also requires subst substantive change in food sovereignty, access to intercultural and multilingual education in sexual and reproductive health for Bolivian women. From our experience, I would like to highlight that the part active participation of indigenous peoples in the affairs of state has made our recent achievements possible. And that is why I call on this assembly to continue making progress towards strengthening the rights and participation of indigenous peoples. Another topic of great interest to my country are the rights of women. It is estimated that in the world, 736 million women, that is one out of three women around the world have been victims of physical violence or sexual violence. Violence suffered by women needs to stop being a solitary and private experience and it needs to be recognized as a public issue on which we need to take urgent action. Maternal mortality is another great issue we must grapple with since every day 800 women die due to pregnancy-related complications. Sustainable development will not be possible if we do not provide women with an opportunity to live without fear of violence and to exercise their reproductive and sexual rights with access to universal health care. Six, unearthing or stopping the international system of implementing sanctions and unilateral coercive action. We need to uproot this. Brother Vice President, another topic that I could not but mention on this opportunity is that that relates to unilateral coercive measures and sanctions that are imposed on brother peoples, undermining their ability to develop the most basic human rights. These measures are a reflection of a dysfunctional system which is far removed from international law and multilateral. It's a clear examples of these measures, which is illegal, inhuman, and criminal, is the economic and financial block embargo imposed by the United States against Cuba. The restrictions imposed make it difficult to have access to food, medicine, and other basic goods, creating human suffering, which impacts their economy and development. We call for the compliance with the many resolutions adopted by this General Assembly and to build a world that's fair and more solidarity, where all countries can prosper without regard to their political differences. We also reject and condemn the inclusion of Cuba as a promoter of terrorism on the unilateral list of the United States, using this argument to impose greater restrictive measures against the Cuban people. These measures run counter to the United Nations Charter and the mandate of the Security Council, and that is why they are not supported by, nor are they valid in light of international law, but still, they very much affect the right to development of the Cuban people. Seven, we must take stop as soon as possible the trampling of the Palestinian people. With regard to the Israeli occupation of Palestine, we cannot continue allowing the suffering of the Palestinian people. Reiterate our support to world and regional initiatives, international law, and the United Nations resolutions that seek to guarantee a solution whereby the Palestinian people can exercise its right to self-determination and build its own state, which is free, independent, and sovereign with, within the borders, pre-1967 borders, and with East Jerusalem as its capital. Finally, brothers and sisters, the current crisis urgently requires a United Nations organization that stands strong, that upholds the principles that created it, that is committed to peace, and that maintains its intergovernmental nature without, however, subordination to any hegemonic power, be it economic, political, or military. Because the solutions to the many challenges facing humanity will only become a reality with sincere commitment and the political determination of all countries and their actors and prioritizing the common interests of humankind and of especially the most vulnerable people and sectors of humanity. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I thank the Constitutional President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia for uh, the statement that he's made. I would ask protocol to uh, escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now listen to a statement by His Excellency Kasim Yomar Tokayev, President of the Republic of Kazakhstan. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Kasim Yomar Tokayev, President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, and I invite him to address this Assembly, the General Assembly. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, today, Humanity faces enormous shifts unseen in a century and has ended yet another period of geopolitical confrontation. The essence of the threat comes from the simultaneous erosion of fundamental principles of international law embodied in the Charter of the United Nations. The displacement of these pillars puts an increasingly heavy burden on the existing structure of international relations and creates confrontations. The pattern of non-compliance, suspension, and withdrawal from key international legal instruments is extremely concerning as it could lead to the point of no return. This situation disrupts the trading system, weakens the supply chains that drive economic life, damages food security, and accelerates inflation. Current negative trends further exacerbate human suffering. 108 million people are forcibly displaced, 
more than 1 billion live in poverty, and 2 billion do not have access to essential medicines. The ultimate result is humanity's loss of confidence in the future stable development of the world. The younger generations no longer believe that the world they inherit will be a better one. Therefore, Kazakhstan finds it's necessary to restate its unwavering commitment to the principles of the United Nations Charter. The leaders gathered here are responsible for the fate and future of humankind. Yet, as we approach the United Nations 80th anniversary, we have come almost full cycle to the organization's point of departure. The resolution of political issues by force, in fact, results only in deadlock. Dialogue is the only way to create a conducive environment that enables agreement on new principles and norms. Despite best efforts, conflicts persist in many regions of the world. We urge all parties to seek diplomatic solutions to the conflicts based on the UN Charter and universally recognized international law. In this regard, Kazakhstan commends all efforts and plans proposed by different states and groups of countries in support of a political settlement of the Ukrainian crisis. Diplomacy and dialogue should always prevail in seeking the resolution of international disputes. We must therefore together exert the greatest efforts to stabilize the only system of global institutions we have. We will not succeed in tackling these challenges without a comprehensive reform of the Security Council. It's an urgent need of our time that meets the interests of the vast majority of humanity. I'm strongly convinced that the voices of middle powers and all developing countries in the Council need to be amplified and clearly heard. Since the Security Council appears unable to move beyond deadlock, it should become more representative so that other countries, including Kazakhstan, can play a greater role in the maintenance of peace and security. In our region, the growing engagement of member states has been a positive force in the transformation of the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia into a full-fledged international organization that can, can contribute to continental mediation and peacemaking. Similarly, as the current chair of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Kazakhstan put forward the initiative of World Unity for Just Peace and Harmony. This initiative, which we invite you to join, comprises a new security paradigm, a fair economic environment, and a clean planet. Open dialogue between the Global South and the Global North is its central pillar. Of all the challenges we face, perhaps the most destructive is the threat of use of nuclear weapons. 30 years ago, Kazakhstan voluntarily renounced the fourth largest inherited nuclear arsenal. That's why the logic of the nuclear agenda must be reversed. Only mutual trust and cooperation between nuclear powers on the path to a world free of nuclear weapons can produce global stability. In this context, Kazakhstan declares its continuous commitment to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We support the development of new mechanisms in the field of disarmament and non-proliferation. A strategic plan for the complete renunciation of nuclear weapons by 2045 could well be the most significant contribution to the global security of this generation of leaders. At the same time, COVID-19 has painfully illustrated our vulnerability to future biological risks and threats. Kazakhstan appeals to the Secretary General and the President of this Assembly to launch the process of establishing an international agency for, for biological safety. We welcome the Secretary General's new agenda for peace. This strategic document must confront a trust vacuum and growing hostility in the world. In the upcoming summit of the future next year, Kazakhstan will play a constructive and supportive role to adopt a pact for the future. But the search for peace is not just about the banning of weapons or the signing of declarations. Interreligious and interfaith dialogue plays a key role in fostering a culture of peace. We are therefore concerned about recent, recent acts of profound disrespect towards holy books. Such barbaric acts against Islam or any other religions cannot be accepted as expressions of freedom, free speech, and democracy. All holy books, including Quran, deserve legal protection against vandalism. Finally, a culture of peace can only be based on the principles of unity in diversity and mutual respect. I'm proud, therefore, of the outstanding role of the Astana-based Congress of the leaders of world religions. In brief, Kazakhstan is a peace-loving nation that pursues its own national interest while continuously searching for peaceful solutions of pending international issues. Independence, territorial integrity, and sovereignty are core principles that will guide my people now and in the future. We will continue cooperation with our major allies on all strategic issues. Ladies and gentlemen, we need new assessments that will enable us to tackle pressing global economic problems while ensuring the right to development. To do this, we require an open, transparent, and inclusive multilateral trading system based on WTO principles and rules. We also need to think about a better global food security system. Nearly 10% of the world's population faced hunger last year. We must boost voluntary information exchange on food security, including volumes of production, and the export on import of food products. In concert, 
we must enable the transparent tracking of funding from the international community in response to food crisis. Kazakhstan is ready to act as a regional food supply hub. We have all the required resources, infrastructure, and logistics in place for these purposes. Kazakhstan is already a reliable link for nearly 80% of overland transit traffic between Asia and Europe. The Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, the so-called Middle Corridor, can significantly strengthen east-west engagement. This route could increase the pace of trade between critical markets, cutting by almost half the amount of time required to transport goods via the maritime route. Dear friends, the urgency of climate action risks to become a cliche. But it is a dangerous cliche, because immediate, effective, and transformational steps are urgently required to prioritize environmental protection. Central Asia is one of its front lines. Even if we successfully limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by 2030, which looks increasingly unlikely, we will experience between two and, uh, two and a half degrees of temperature rise in Central Asia. Despite the long road of the Paris Climate Agreement, we must all remain committed to a carbon-free future. The climate agenda should not be used to introduce measures restricting trade and investment cooperation. Instead, we must focus on positive change, such as climate positive actions identified by the United Nations, including investing in green jobs, ending fossil fuel subsidies, and ensuring that all climate actions are fair, inclusive, and involve women at all levels. Yet, without proper funding, ambitious plans to combat climate change will remain unmet. In this regard, we propose to launch Just Energy Transition Partnership in Kazakhstan. A gradual, sustainable, and socially responsible transition away from coal would be a big bonus for global climate change goals. Kazakhstan's initiative to open the project office for Central Asia on climate change and green energy in Almaty can lead on these issues. We look forward to hosting a regional climate summit in Kazakhstan in 2026 under the United Nations auspices. In our region, we, hear, we have seen that water scarcity has created serious economic and other challenges in transboundary river basins. This will be replaced across the world. By 2040, global demand for water may outstrip supply by as much as 40%. We must therefore combine political will and economic resources to address this critical global issue simultaneous with climate action. Next year, we will assume chairmanship of the International Fund for Saving the RLC. We will continue efforts to prevent further degradation of the environment and its impact on livelihoods around what was once the fourth largest lake on the planet. Today, it is the world's largest lake, the Caspian Sea, that also faces ecological challenges, including shallowing, water diversion, and the pollution of flora and fauna. Saving the Caspian Sea must be a matter of common priority that requires long-term international cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, Kazakhstan is committed to further enhancing multifaceted cooperation with the countries of Central Asia. Our region can play a more active role as a cohesive and independent part of the international community while contributing to global development processes. Fortunately, economic activity is growing. Over the last five years, intra-regional trade doubled to 10 billion US dollars. Our regional agenda includes Afghanistan, which must become a stable